Matt Drudge started his website called The Drudge Report in 1995. In those early beginnings, he had just 1,000 email subscribers. Within a short time, that number jumped to hundreds of thousands. Up until the mid-2000s, Mr. Drudge was very visible, appearing on television and hosting his own radio show. Without notice to his public, he's just disappeared from public view. Chris Moody just finished hosting an eight-part podcast series called Finding Matt Drudge. We asked him to tell us what he found. Hi, it's John from C-SPAN. Imagine 45 years ago, when there were just a handful of television networks, C-SPAN first went on the air bringing an unfiltered view of government directly to America's living rooms. No spin, no commentary, just pure democracy in action. And it's Janae from C-SPAN. It was a bold experiment. We finally had a front row seat to Congress, the White House, and the campaign trail, all without government funding. As we celebrate 45 years and a legacy of unfiltered access, we ask for your support of a donation in honor of over four decades of service. Your gift, no matter how big or small, will help maintain this vital resource for access to the democratic process. And you can help ensure another 45 years of witnessing history unfold and empowering citizens to be informed and engaged in the political process. Visit cspan.org slash donate today and join our 45th anniversary campaign. Thanks for supporting C-SPAN, your unfiltered view of government. Visit cspan.org slash donate today to make your gift of support. Thanks. Chris Moody, why did you do an eight-part podcast called Finding Matt Drudge? Well, I think it starts from the reason that Matt Drudge has been an important cultural force in media and in politics now for in four separate decades now, if you count them all up, starting in the 1990s when he really burst onto the scene uh, with his exclusive scoops on entertainment and then the big one, the big bombshell about the Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton scandal. And he uh, retained that power over the media and success for many, many years uh, until a couple of years ago where he really seemed to, well, fall off the face of the earth. And uh, in doing this podcast, we wanted to find out why someone who was so important to uh, American life for such a long time decided to disappear and and speak not in public, to not be photographed, to not do interviews, but only speak through his website, The Drudge Report, uh, to tell the story of this person um, who really, really matters and try to find more about his thoughts on the current times um, and also to reflect on his career. When did you start trying to find him? You know, this has been a long time coming. Uh, we've been working on this show for a couple of years. And uh, in fact, on just uh, week one, I will tell you this, uh, our creator named Jamie Weinstein, right when we said, OK, we're going to do this show, went into the Palm Restaurant in Washington, D.C. to have a celebratory dinner to celebrate the show launching. And the maitre d' at the Palm Restaurant rushed over to him and said, you will never believe who just walked out of the restaurant, Matt Drudge. We missed him by 10 minutes on our first week of working on this show. Uh, and then we have been working on trying to track him down uh, for a couple of years uh, now. So it's it's been uh, quite a project. In the last episode, you talked to Jamie Weinstein, who... Uh played a large role in all this. And I, I run a little bit of what he said there so people can be introduced to him. He shaped and continues to shape in many ways the media narrative. So we ought to know kind of who that person is and, and what influences him and what drives him. But then it's also kind of a mystery tale. And, and there's a lot of mysteries uh, that you are answering and trying to answer in the show, including why did Drudge become increasingly reclusive throughout his career? Why did uh, he turn against Donald Trump after so vociferously and passionately uh, in his sight, so vociferously and passionately supporting him? And then the question that even some of the people that we interview think is possible, which is that he doesn't run the site anymore. He sold it to 
in I guess some some variations, a multi-billionaire liberal who uh, could turn the site uh, into something different than what it was, which was at the time it switched kind of a, a megaphone for, for MAGA and, and Donald Trump. Who is Jamie Weinstein? Jamie Weinstein is a former colleague of mine from many years back. We're news reporters in Washington, D.C., uh, and he's the one who approached me about doing this podcast. Jamie has been interested in Matt Drudge for many, many years, um, and he wanted to find Matt Drudge, and he asked me, uh, would you like to host this show and and help produce it and, and ride it? Uh, and I said, you know, Jamie, that sounds like a lot of fun. So he, Jamie Weinstein is the person who brought all of this uh, uh, into motion and, and uh, got this started. And uh, we also partnered with iHeartMedia uh, to do the show as well. And and so Jamie has been an excellent collaborator uh, and a, a passionate fellow searcher for Matt Drudge along with me. As we talk today, where are you? I'm in Boone, North Carolina, where I uh, teach journalism at Appalachian State University. Um, but I spent a lot of time on airplanes uh, for this project. Uh, it took me to Miami, Florida, where uh, Drudge lives uh, in that area at least part of the year. Went out to Las Vegas, Nevada, where Drudge spends a lot of time. Uh, and spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C., tracking down people who have spent time with Matt Drudge uh, and are wondering the same questions. Where did he go and what happened to him? Let's uh, pretend that somebody listening to this has no idea who we're talking about. Give us the background on Matt Drudge and what do they see if they go to his website? Well, Matt Drudge is a, I say he's an internet and media pioneer. In the early days of the consumer internet in the 1990s, uh, Drudge was in his late 20s or so, and uh, he started this newsletter that became a website, and he called it the Drudge Report. And if you pull up the Drudge Report, it looks to this day like a 1990s website. It uses old-timey newspaper font. Uh, there are no real bells and whistles. The photographs are usually limited, and if they're there, they're often in black and white. Uh, he's retained that look for years. Well, Matt Drudge broke some major stories in the 1990s, and he basically forced the legacy media to into the Internet age, forcing them to move faster, uh, to have a new set of competitors that were digital websites that they never had had to compete with before. As you know, Brian, these were the gatekeepers of politics and media. And suddenly people were flooding through those gates like Matt Drudge and making it so they had to innovate. He went on to have his own Fox News show. He had a radio show. He appeared as a guest on Letterman. He walked the red carpet at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. He was a frequent guest on shows like yours on C-SPAN. Uh, he was a gadfly. He was an important voice and somebody that uh, broke news about political campaigns um, and drove uh, news. Uh, it was very frequent that uh, at ABC News, NBC producers would be reading the Drudge Report to find the latest information. This is pre-Twitter, pre-social media times. But he also had deep relationships with presidential and political campaigns that would try to feed him information and behoove him to tell stories that were kind of on their side um, uh, to, to benefit them. Uh, and so he had the ear of some of the most powerful people in the United States, in both media and all the way up to the White House, in both, I would say, Republican and Democratic uh, campaigns and administrations. So he's somebody who has shaped the way we live and consume the digital ecosystem today. Uh, and I would argue that still really, really matters. We have some video, I mean, some sound from uh, his first appearance on C-SPAN, which was in 1997, June 30th. And so let's listen. We don't want to steal much of your podcast because you want people to go listen to the whole thing. But here's a little bit from his first appearance so we can hear what he sounds like. What do you do? Um, I've got about 60,000 readers, and it, it's a network of, of, of tipsters uh, and gossip, a lot of it Washington gossip. Uh, and it just moved quickly, and it's moved without an editor. I'm the editor and it's moved without advertisers. So uh, it's, it's a whole new way of communicating, as far as I can tell, and uh, it's exciting you, as heck. How do you pay for it? Uh, it doesn't. It, there's no fee involved except for my time. It's self-supportive. How do you make money? Um, I've just signed on with America Online, who's going to start uh, 
carrying the thing. So you, you make money other ways besides the actual uh, website. I'm trying to keep it advertiser free uh, simply, be, be, simply because I think that's not the future. The medium is not advertising. 60,000 was all the number that used to read him back in 1997? Well, that's before the Hillary Clinton, or excuse me, the Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton story that really burst him uh, into the limelight, made him a household name. Uh, but 60,000 in 1997 is uh, nothing to sneeze at for a guy that lives in a little apartment in Hollywood with a six toed cat alone, you know, <laughs> like he's doing went pretty well as an independent person who didn't have to go through uh, the the gatekeepers of the Washington Post or the New York Times. He's doing that all on his own. Now, I will say that today he does have advertising and he does make quite a bit of money and has made millions and millions of dollars off of this site. He did sell advertising because he developed a website that got so many clicks and eyeballs that rivaled many large legacy media outlets. And with that low of an overhead, you know, there's only times when he it, it was just himself, but there's often times where he might have had one or a couple employees didn't cost him a lot to run that site. Uh, and he was able to reap the financial re rewards because of it, but not just the financial rewards. I, I think um, earning the respect of the legacy media oftentimes begrudgingly. Uh, he came to Washington in the late 90s uh, after the Lewinsky uh, scandal came came out, and he spoke at the National Press Club, uh, gave a big speech about the future of media and how he was breaking barriers. And let me tell you, I don't know if you were there, Brian, but he got a cold, cold reception. And the Q&A, you can watch this on YouTube afterwards, is full of reporters just questioning him in ways reporters should, but really, really hostile to what he was. I don't think they realized that a couple of years later they would be reliant on him for the scoops that they'd be following up on um, not that much later. Um, and so he really uh, forced his way in uh, and I think uh, earned that begrudging respect pretty quickly. We covered that speech. It's available on in our archive and uh, we'll, I'll run a clip a little, in a little bit from it. But uh, describe him. Uh, well, by the way, besides – and I'm not as, – as, we're not going to – Tell the audience what the conclusion of trying to find him is because that's not fair. You've got to be able to listen to the whole thing. But let's say before you started this, had you ever met him? I had not met him, but I knew so many people who had. And when I say meet him, so many people had the same kind of story. They ran into him at a cocktail party in Washington and had an engaging, fascinating conversation. And then he was off to the next person or they saw him in an elevator or uh, they set up a coffee with him and he never showed up. You know, things like that. Everybody had kind of a funny little tale. I, I spoke to Sean Spicer, uh, Donald Trump's former White House spokesman, who late at night at an after party after the White House correspondence dinner, uh, uh, Matt Drudge used to or he often would wear a fedora hat wherever he went. It was kind of his trademark. And Sean Spicer, after maybe a few drinks, uh, uh, grabbed the hat off of him and ran around and stole it, you know, and gave it back after a few minutes. But everybody just kind of had these these strange uh, interactions with him. I never did. But I did as a reporter. I'd send him my stories quite frequently over email, and a lot of other reporters would send them on email or the now defunct AOL Instant Messenger. Um, and I would get results. I would get links on the on his website, the Drudge Report, uh, because of that. Uh, and I still do to this day. When I still write and publish, sometimes I get on the Drudge Report um, even now. We know how powerful he is because we he will link to us in some of the major events, and the numbers just go off the chart. Uh, how many people work for him? Well, it's usually just one, maybe two people at a time. There are a handful of, of D.C. reporters who have gone on to become editors at the Drudge Report where they will often work a shift of five to six hours a day. And then Matt will pick up in the afternoon. Um, and to describe the site, it's a series of links. Uh, you can go to the DrudgeReport.com. You can see this right now to outside sources. And then occasionally when he has his own scoops, he'll put it up at the top with a big flashing siren uh, for his own reporting. Um, and, and so 
an editor will get up in the morning and start posting links from around the web. Uh, and it's a, it's actually a really engaging, interesting site where you can, you know, just a one-stop shop to find all kinds of stories ranging from politics, media, music, even UFO stuff sometimes if that tickles his fancy at the moment. You know, uh, it's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, uh, the first employee uh, was Andrew Breitbart, uh, who went on to uh, start Breitbart.com before he passed away uh, in 2012. Uh, and then some other reporters, some for the Washington Times and the Weekly Standard, uh, kind of right of center uh, publications have have worked for him. But we're not talking a big staff. We're not talking a newsroom. Uh, it's usually just uh, one person that uh, logs on from wherever they want and gets to work. So how, you know, people that haven't paid attention and they see the site and they go there because of the aggregation of uh, all the different uh, stories, how does his advertising make money for him? Well, in the digital media economy, uh, the higher number of eyeballs you have, the higher um, prices you can charge for ads. Uh, this was going to be the great promise of digital media uh, and basically uh, or of you know newspapers trying to start websites would, would say, well, we'll just run it on ads just like we did on newspapers. But unfortunately, digital ads don't um, make as much money. But for Drudge, with that low overhead combined with the massive amounts of traffic, I mean, we're talking millions, even tens of millions of people a day visiting the site, especially at its height, uh, that's a lot of money. You're going to pay money to get your ad on that site. And, you know, there's a handful of ads there at all times, and it's just constantly pouring money into his coffers um, to this day be because of it. But that's, uh, you know, that's a, a simple kind of um, – a, a, a simple approach, but it really has worked. It, and there's only one page. There's nowhere else to click, really. Um, that's about it. What you see is what you get. But um, it has worked for him really, really well, especially with that low amount of overhead. Did you check to see, by the way, how much it costs for an ad? I have not learned that, no. But I, I did speak with people who did facilitate ads with him, and um, they the numbers – that they quoted saying uh, how much he earns. Uh, I mean, it's very, very high. He's making a lot of money on that site. And and you can just see the, the number of homes he has around the country, the cost of those homes. Um, he, he's not a billionaire by any stretch that we were able to find, but um, a very, very comfortable millionaire. You say millionaire. Certainly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so where, where, <laughs> where has he been living? <laughs> well, that's part of the fun, right? Uh, not just one place. Uh, he has a compound uh, in South Florida. Uh, he used to live uh, closer to like downtown Miami Beach. He moved west out to this rural area uh, near the Everglades. It's, it's a place that is meant to not be seen from the road or even if you look at his address from Google Earth, it's covered in trees. You don't even see a house. It is meant to somebody to be off the grid as much as possible. It's several acres way out there. If you keep going, you'll hit the Everglades. It's largely farmland, very tropical there. He also has an address in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, a beautiful house there. Um, and then he's known to spend long periods of time in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, and uh, he spends time in Israel. I don't know if he owns property there, but uh, you know, with that laptop of his, he can just go just about anywhere. Now, that's very typical today. Digital nomadism is not new in 2024. But when he started doing it 20 years ago, it certainly was the idea that he could take his newsroom wherever he wanted. Um, I do know that he always had his watch set to New York East Coast time in the United States. So we always knew what time it was um, there. Uh, and and he worked on, on those hours as far as I as I know. But he is somebody who who likes to travel, likes to have people not know where he is at any given time. Uh, a Vanity Fair story spoke to a good friend of his uh, just a couple of years ago, Ann Coulter, remains a friend of Matt Drudge. And she said this quote, something to the extent of, Matt Drudge and I are leaving Florida and we're not going to tell anybody where we're going. And I talked to Ann Coulter and she wouldn't tell me either. Um, while we were working on this project just a couple of months ago, Matt Drudge's home in Florida went on the market for sale. So he continues to be on the move. So who would not talk to you for the, your podcast? 
Uh, Ann Coulter did not speak to us um, uh, on on the record. Uh, I, I had exchanged some emails with her, you know, requesting an interview request as, as you would. Um, there were also, I think, people, let's say reporters in right of center media that were, you know, didn't want to say anything that might hinder their chance of getting links on the Drudge Report because they still matter to get those those links. Um, and uh, gosh, let's see, uh, um, some some Trump uh, people that uh, we couldn't get in touch with, with that we wanted to, uh, you know, there were a few unreturned email requests. But, you know, if you listen to this show, you will find voices uh, that are very surprising. Uh, people from all over, from Steve Bannon and Tucker Carlson um, on, on the right uh, to Philippe Rines, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, spokesman uh, on, on the left, uh, Bill Press on the left, people left, right, and center uh, spoke to us for the show, which was really, really fun to be able to have that many kinds of voices. This is not just a show for one team uh, because he trafficked in so many circles. Um, but I, I think people like like Ann Coulter, who are still close to to Drudge, uh, were, were hesitant to speak with us. And then we also tried to get in touch with um, who we think is still working for Drudge currently and could not get in touch with that person uh, either. Here's an excerpt from your podcast, and it is uh, Tucker Carlson talking about uh, one of uh, Drudge's editors. I went down to a Starbucks in some far suburban part of Northern Virginia and sat down with Joe Curl and just point blank said, is there, you know, let's establish some kind of business relationship. You know, is there, I, I don't know what the parameters of it would be, but is there some way that, you know, we could get a formal relationship, non-publicized, but, you know, where you link to our stuff? He looked at me like it was an FBI sting operation. I'll never forget it. Like I was trying to entrap him or something, which of course I wasn't, obviously. But he said to me, you know, I absolutely cannot even have this conversation. Matt wouldn't like it. Matt doesn't do anything like that. He considers it corrupt. I said, well, I'm not suggesting anything corrupt, of course, but... He said, nope, Matt would consider that betrayal and corruption. And there's no chance I will even have this conversation with you, and I'm not in a position to make that deal anyway. Give us the background on that. And um, because, as you know, because I've listened to your, obviously, to your podcast, that people want to be on his site, and they'll go to great lengths, just like Tucker Carlson was saying. And how does that work? Well, this was around 2010, and Tucker Carlson had just started a new website called The Daily Caller, a uh, digital media enterprise. Um, I was uh, one of their early hires. I was a reporter there, um, one of my first jobs in journalism. Uh, and, you know, we were a sc scrappy upstart. Uh, but one thing we couldn't get was a link on the Drudge Report to our reporting. Even if we broke news, even if we had stuff that would be super compelling, Drudge would not link to the site, which was a real problem because the site needed that kind of traffic to get us off the ground. So Tucker was getting a little worried what was going to happen if we couldn't get the traffic we needed. And that's when he contacted Joe Curl to try to have this conversation, to try to work out some kind of deal. That, that spooked Joe Curl, uh, who was the editor at the time, uh, pretty hard. Um, and uh, it turned out, I spoke with Joe Curl. He, he does appear on the podcast. He told his side of the story, and, and he said that Matt Drudge is a person who can hold a grudge for a very, very long time. And he had an interaction uh, a couple of years before then uh, with Tucker Carlson, where Tucker, at least the way Drudge kind of saw it, um, betrayed a private conversation that they had had and he told other people. And and Drudge said, oh, I'm never going to link to anything he does. And he held that grudge for many, many years. Um, while I was at the Daily Caller, uh, Tucker even held a contest to try to see who could write the best Drudge story or the dr the best story that would end up on the Drudge Report, right? Um, and, and we eventually, about a year in or so, we finally did get that Drudge link on the Daily Caller. I remember it was a day of immense celebration and relief. And then it, the traffic came in and it was so heavy that it shut down our site. <laughs> so it was a mixed blessing uh, there. But um, 
But it just goes to show like the lengths that uh, digital media entrepreneurs or editors would go to try to get on the Drudge Report. Uh, I know that there are there's one publication who had an entire team of people that were just – they had to write stories that were Drudge bait. That was their goal. And when they did get that Drudge link, their editor would often buy them a bottle of bourbon or something nice like that. There was a media ecosystem all around the Drudge Report that existed for many, many years. It's not that way – Today, as much social media has kind of uh, supplanted a, a, a lot of that, but uh, it was real. If you got a Drudge link as a young reporter in Washington, when you went out to the bars that night, people bought you drinks and congratulated you. Uh, it sounds funny, but it's true. As you know, there's been a book written about him a couple years ago. What what was that book, and what did you learn from the author? Uh, it was the uh, first biography of Matt Drudge written by Matt Leshack, uh, who did some incredible work going uh, to uh, to understand Matt Drudge's childhood and background. Uh, as a mysterious figure, uh, his origin story was largely unknown, unearthed. And and Matt got a hold of some. I mean, he's an excellent reporter. He's um, does does his work uh, with doc documentation he got access to some some great documents and some great interviews and learned uh what kind of person matt drudge was as a as a young person he grew up near washington dc in the suburbs in maryland kind of in the shadow of institutions like the washington post but you know he lacked the educational uh, pedigree uh, or class pedigree of somebody uh, who might be accepted in a place like the Washington Post, or at least that's how he saw it. Um, and, and I think he kind of felt uh, like he was never included in that and was an outsider. Uh, and I think that's something that really drove him through his career. He appreciated being an independent voice that could often stick it to the legacy media and scoop them at their own game. And uh, I think we see that in the National Press Club speech, kind of a victory lap. Um, and, and I think he's proud of remaining independent um, to this day. Uh, but but Matt's book, if anybody's interested in in the real details of his childhood, but also uh, his rise, uh, the Hillary Clinton story, or the, the Monica Lewinsky, Bill Clinton story, um, and um, certainly the access to Trump later in his career. Uh, Drudge Revolution is the name of the book, and it is an excellent and riveting read. As you know, I mean, he didn't have any college, is my understanding from listening to you. And, and neither did Larry King. Uh, and people like uh, many many others, including Brian Williams, and uh, uh, I can go down the list of people who never, they didn't graduate. They might have had a little bit of college. What is it about media people who skip the college thing but end up being very successful? You know, I'll tell you, as, as you know, over the years, uh, I think the media landscape has changed in a way that it was more of a working class, blue collar kind of industry many, many years ago. And it is certainly now in, uh, at least in the national media, more of an elite gatekeeping kind of institution where you have to go to the right schools and you have to, um, uh, you know, speak the right kind of way. Uh, this certainly exists at the most elite levels. Uh, and, and I think that has hurt reporting in a way that you lose class diversity, regional diversity. And so when somebody comes in who sees things a little bit differently, who doesn't, who didn't go to the same boarding schools or the same colleges, uh, whose parents don't live in the tri-state area, you know, um, or, or outside the suburbs of Washington, that kind of thing, um, they have a nose for news that makes things uh, not necessarily better, but certainly you see things from a different perspective. You can stand out from the pack. You can get scoops that other people might miss. Um, I mean, it's certainly like I, how I felt when you know, I, I'm from El Cajon, California, and I came to Washington not knowing anything and, and really just um, – tried to tried to find stories that other people didn't even know they should be looking for. And, and so um, I think those people can be successful in the same way that a lot of people in Silicon Valley uh, maybe don't go to college, but they they go up to, you know, Northern California and they invent something that no one else thought of before. Um, there's different kinds of sophistication. And I think it's important for newsrooms to, in order to have that kind of diversity that's needed to cover a country as large and vast as ours, you need to be open to people like that because they're going to see things differently than when everybody that works for you just went to the same school. Matt Dredge would go to the White House Correspondents' Dinner uh, every year. 
And we would benefit because he would come do the call-in show. And I can remember one time he was on the show and I was, frankly, my jaw dropped because he had this little antenna on, you don't do this anymore, but this little antenna on his computer. And he said, do you want to watch me change a headline on one of my stories uh, on dr the Drudge Report? I said, sure. And right there in front of us with very little time, he changed the headline which just leads me to ask you the question about how much did he know about technology and where did he learn it? His father bought him uh, what is now an old computer in the early 1990s. Um, his, his son wasn't really going places at that time. Uh, he, as you said, he didn't go to college. Uh, he's lived in this one-room apartment and he was working at a gift shop at CBS Studios. So dad gives him this computer and he's Getting starts to get really involved in early chat rooms online and sees a potential for delivering information and sharing information very, very quickly over the Internet, which now we all do every single day. But back then, only the early adopters were, were a part of it. And, uh, you know, uh, he starts digging through the trash at CBS Studios, where he's a manager at this gift shop, and he finds the ratings for different shows. And he's like, you know what? These haven't been publicly reported in major news outlets. I'm just going to put them up on my little chat board on AOL Instant Messenger or, or you know. And that's how he starts to develop the, the newsletter uh, and then later on eventually the, the website. And so it's very rudimentary. He's not a computer whiz by any means. Um, the coding uh, – this is something that Joseph Curl told me, the former editor. The coding of the Drudge Report is immensely simple. It is 90s era coding, even to this day, to change things on the website. Um, it's very manual. You know, you, you he hasn't changed it in in now some 30 years or so. Uh, and and that, I, I, I think, speaks to kind of the origin of, of what he built. Uh, there was nothing very fancy about it, but it was the tone and it was the level of scoops and the broad range of, of stories and interest that he had. And, and that's what kept drawing people in, even if it was, uh, as technology grew, uh, an ugly or outdated kind of site. As you know, today, if you go on his site, a lot of the links are to magazines or articles that have a paywall, which means you have to buy the New York Times or whatever. But he's gotten around the New York Times paywall by how? Well, the paywall movement, which I, I do support because we need to find a way to pay for this. Uh, it was just announced today that the Atlantic magazine is now profitable. They have more than a million subscribers, so something is working. But the paywall has changed digital media. You can't just link all over the place because you'll a lot of the people might not be subscribers. So he has actually found um, websites based in other countries that will copy and paste from the New York Times and basically steal, rip off entire New York Times stories. And if he wants you to read a New York Times story, he'll link to this site it's, um, called D News. It's spelled in a funny way. I won't bother. Um, uh, he will also go to sites like MSN.com, which have relationships with places like the Washington Post and other publications. Yahoo News has a similar arrangement with some publications where they are non-paywalled version, versions of these stories. And so that's what he looks to. So he will not link to a paywalled version. So for example, like I write for the Washington Post fairly frequently, um, and oftentimes my stories will get picked up by like you know Anchorage Daily News or some you know paper somewhere in the in the country. And if there's no paywall and he wants to link to my story, he'll not link to my Washington Post link. He'll link to the Anchorage publication, something like that. Uh, but uh, it's funny, uh, Brian. Uh, the only place I've seen him linking to that has a paywall to this day is the Wall Street Journal. So they get a pass <laughs> for some reason, but nobody else really does. I actually saw him link to the Greenwich, I think it's, the, I hope I'm saying it right, the Greenwich Times in Greenwich, Connecticut for the Post, because they, at the time at least, didn't have a paywall. Let's go back um, to uh, his appearance before the press club and uh, listen to what's just a short minute of what he was saying to the press club. This was back in 1998. Exalted minds the panelists in the audience whose average IQ exceeds the Dow Jones, didn't appear to have a clue what this internet's gonna do, what we're going to make of it, what we're gonna, uh, what this is all gonna turn into. But I have glimpses, 
And sometimes deep in the middle of the night, I tell them to Bill Paley. We have entered an era vibrating with the din of small voices. Every citizen can be a reporter, can take on the powers that be. The difference between the internet, television, and radio, magazines, newspapers is the two-way communication. The net gives as much voice to a 13-year-old computer geek like me as to a CEO or speaker of the house. We all become equal. And you would be amazed what the ordinary guy knows. If somebody didn't remember, Bill Paley was the top guy at CBS uh, long since uh, past. But uh, Matt, Matt Drudge gave that speech, and you said earlier it was in a hostile environment. I wonder why he doesn't want to do that today, because he would still be a hot prospect, and he also could make a lot of money just speaking around the country. Well, that is the one of the major questions of the podcast. Why doesn't he want to be out there anymore? And I have a lot of theories. I have a lot of thoughts. I've been thinking about this quite a while. Uh, one idea is that he has already said publicly everything he wants to say publicly, and now he has... He has this website and he thinks that that is the most effective way that he can say what he wants to say and express himself. Um, there's baggage that comes with being a public person. Uh, as he rose in prominence, uh, and he happily did so, having his own TV shows, walking that red carpet, going on your show, Brian, uh, I, he loved it. He, he loved the attention. He loved the victory laps. But that comes with reporters doing profiles about you and your personal life and asking questions of your parents and your lovers and all these kinds of things that I think he really grew tired of that side of fame and said, why would I put myself up for this kind of exposure when I can have the same level of impact, he argues, through his website and not deal with that? And, and that was a calculation that that he made. Um, uh, he, he's been he'd been thinking about dropping out actually for quite a while, um, uh, just growing tired of of the game of of um, being an American celebrity, even a political or media celebrity. Um, but uh, you know, I, I do hope that uh, we get a, 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 a another book out of Matt Drudge uh, before the end, you know, where he can, tell us a lot of these kinds of, of, of things um, in his own words, I, I think that would be really, really fascinating. And then we do have a new season of Matt Drudge where he does come publicly um, uh, onto the forefront. He kind of dabbled with it a little bit during the Trump time uh, where he would appear publicly at presidential debates. He went to a primary debate and a general election debate. He appeared um, in the CNN, got their cameras on Drudge's face. He was sitting with Anna Coulter at one of the debates. That's actually the last time I think the public has seen his face uh, on television uh, some 10 years ago or so. Um, and he also advised the Trump campaign uh, quite a bit uh, over phone calls with uh, Kushner and, and others. Even on election night, he visited the White House. So uh, even though he wasn't going on uh, shows as much as he was, uh, he still very much had a hand in things, If it, uh, even if it was kind of behind the scenes. What was the story of his strange appearance uh, down in Texas when he surfaced in the studio, but you never saw him? Well, he started dabbling uh, about 12 years ago or so uh, with, uh, well, maybe even more than that, but with conspiracy theories and started linking a lot to conspiracy minded websites. We're talking like Alex Jones Infowars or World Net Daily, which had a lot of stories about uh, the origins of Barack Obama's birth certificate, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and he developed uh, something of a relationship with Alex Jones uh, in Texas, who is a um, well, he, he's a he's a conspiracy theorist. Um, I, what do we call him? An influencer, a, a, a media mogul. You know, a lot of people listen to him, and they'll be mad that I call him a conspiracy theorist, of course. Um, but uh, one day, uh, Alex Jones has this look on his face on his show, and he says, "I can't believe what is about to happen. Uh, you won't believe this. Matt Drudge has just walked into the studio, and he is here with us. And sure enough, there on the show is the voice of Matt Drudge, but not his face." He's hidden uh, as a silhouette and he speaks and he does an interview for about 45 minutes with Alex Jones 
his almost like a witness protection kind of thing. Like his face is 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 blacked out, right? Um, and <laughs> and he talks about his disappointment in the mainstream media and honestly with with the rise of the internet and basically how if you contrast his interview with Alex Jones at that time with the speech you just played Brian uh, a speech of kind of hope and eagerness and excitement for the dream of the internet 20 years or so later when he goes on Alex Jones he is severely disappointed with what he, he calls the flattening of the internet that instead of letting a thousand voices bloom and blossom uh, everything just kind of looks the same if you look at news websites he would argue uh, and and had kind of a dour negative view of things uh, it, it was a real departure from what we saw in that press club speech uh, just a couple of decades before we, we heard from Joe Curl um, earlier uh, where is Joe Curl today? Joe Curl um, lives outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, this is the former um, editor of the Drudge Report. He was a full-time staffer. He used to work at the Washington Times, um, and he would actually write uh, a lot of Washington Times headlines that got picked up by the Drudge Report, and he became a really good um getter of those drudge links until drudge actually called him up and said hey would you ever consider working for me and he left the washington times to work for matt drudge full time um he now runs his own website um that uh, i guess you could maybe call it a, attempting to be a con um a uh, a competitor to the drudge report uh it's a, a right of center digital media company that has a range of stories from all over the the internet um He's he's maybe trying to fill the gap as as Drudge. Uh, we can talk about this, but as Drudge turned against Donald Trump, and some conservatives would argue is now a man of the left or something like that. Um, a lot of websites have come in to fill the void uh, for more right leaning voices online, and I think Curl's website uh, was attempting to do just that. Did his editors and there was another story in your podcast uh, about Bill Press and Charlie Hurt. But do his editors have to sign a non-disclosure agreement? You know, I don't know what they had to sign because if they did, they couldn't talk about it. But, um, well, Joe, Joseph Curl is interviewed in the show, so obviously he didn't have a non-disclosure. But um, they were so cagey about talking about it. Uh, if, if you ended up as an editor for the Drudge Report, you never talked about being an editor. It was one of those CIA, I can neither confirm nor deny kind of things. But very, very quickly, word would get out. Because when you joined the Drudge Report as an employee, one of your first acts was uh, that was demanded of you was to stop speaking publicly, <laughs> to delete or stop contributing to your social media accounts to kind of have your fingerprints removed and you just disappear into the Drudge Report. Uh, he did not want people out there uh, speaking on his behalf because that's what would happen if a Drudge editor came out with a tweet that was very opinionated. The headline, uh, of course, would be like Drudge editor says this, you know, and, and Drudge didn't want that. Uh, so a part of the bargain was that you went dark. You and then there's even people who have worked for Drudge, who to this day would not admit doing so, and I would argue lie about it, <laughs> but, you know, will we'll not tell you uh, that they did, even though it was many, many years ago. Uh, he, he retains that kind of hold. Uh, Joseph Curl is the anomaly. Uh, he like he likes to speak about it because he thinks that the Drudge Report, like me, is, is important, uh, and he's proud of the work he did and, and, you know, wants to contribute to the historical telling of uh, uh, the story. How much did you find out about the rumor that somebody offered him $100 million for it? Well, uh, there's been lots of rumors of offers. Uh, we spoke to Matt Leshack, the biographer of Matt Drudge, and he said that uh, there was an NBA owner who offered him something like that amount and Drudge refused it. Uh, this is swirling around at a time when there are so many rumors about whether Drudge runs the site at all. People on the right, Trump supporters, think that he sold it long ago and is off sitting on a beach, doesn't even touch the site. Um, our reporting doesn't show that at all. There's, I would argue, not enough evidence to make that case. And Matt Leshack flat out said that his reporting confirms that Matt Drudge is still part of the site. And and I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story about that. Um, I, I spoke with Larry O'Connor. Uh, he's a, a media personality uh, in Washington, and uh, he met Drudge at Andrew Breitbart's funeral in 2012. 
And uh, this was a time when Breitbart's site, Breitbart.com, um, was just about to go, you know, get a big relaunch. And Matt Drudge asked Larry, so what are you going to call the site now that Breitbart is gone? And Larry said, well, in his honor, we're going to call it Breitbart after him. And Drudge said, oh, my goodness, I would never allow something like that. When I'm gone, the Drudge Report is gone. And he made a little whirl in his hands of just like, oof, it's gone off in the ether. And he told people kind of a version of that, that he would never give up something that had his name on it. And so there might be a day when the Drudge Report just disappears just like that. Um, and, and then those kind of anecdotes really tell me that he's just not somebody who's just going to sell out and let somebody speak on his behalf because this is – his way of speaking. This is his megaphone. Uh, and uh, it's something that I, I think is very important to him. And he's going to continue to use it. This is in your podcast. It was interesting because Bill Press is very definitely left of center. And his neighbor is Charlie Hurt, who runs the Washington Times conservative opinion page. And somehow or another, those two guys connected in all this. Well, that's the beauty of living on Capitol Hill in Washington. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to fight like cats and dogs on television and then get a drink afterwards. I mean, you've seen that a million times, I'm, I'm sure, in the, the green rooms. And um, people are, are pretty cordial. Uh, you you put down your arms oftentimes for, you know, to have a barbecue with your neighbor. Um, but, uh, you know, Bill did no drudge. Uh, he had dinner with him. Uh, I mean, a man of the left, Bill Press, uh, went down to Miami and spent quality time with Matt Drudge, you know, um, you know, he was the former host of Crossfire on CNN. And so he was always talking with people on the left and the right. Uh, and uh, yeah, he was a neighbor with Charlie Hurt. And even as a friendly neighbor, they'd known each other a long time. He said, hey, so what are you doing now? And Charlie's like, eh, I can't really can't really talk about it, you know, and um, could never really get Charlie Hurt to to admit it, um, even to somebody who's who's a friend. Uh, and I think that also just speaks to the power that Drudge's employment had over people. Like he, people didn't want to lose that job, um, and I, Drudge took it very seriously for for people to just disappear and be quiet about what they were doing. And even to this day, Charlie Hurt doesn't talk about it very much at all. He's one of the people that we didn't get to speak to, unfortunately. Here's a minute um, from his last appearance on our morning program. Uh, this is from October the eighth, two thousand and five. Do you think Matt Drudge and the Drudge Report influences the process if a story shows up on your site? Does it, beyond the, the, the Clinton impeachment, but other stories on a day, day in, day out basis? I have, I have no way of knowing. You know, I sit down here in Miami Beach and I, um, I'm, I mind my business from that standpoint. Uh, I, I always want to get out there fast, furious. Uh, I, I want to make sure that I get as close to reality as I can. I'm able now to update in one second. Last time I was on C-SPAN, it was three seconds to a new headline. Now it's one second to a new headline. So I don't know what the influence has on it. I don't know who's reading. That night of January 17th, uh, 1997 or 98, I didn't know the President of the United States had been passed the Drudge Report by his assistant, Bruce Lindsay. That later came out. So there's no way of knowing uh, who the heck is reading this thing. I just always like to uh, keep it as exciting as possible from my standpoint. Your comment, Chris Moody. You know, it's funny to hear him say that because uh, he loved uh, knowing that Rush Limbaugh, who was a uh, legendary conservative radio host for many decades, read the Drudge Report. Uh, Drudge would speak with Limbaugh before the show. They'd have kind of like a conversation and then Drudge would have you can see this oftentimes you go look at archival stuff drudge or limbaugh would have the drudge report up while he's doing the show and a big part of the show would just be reading through the drudge report and based on our reporting uh we have heard that uh from joseph curl that drudge absolutely loved having an influence on big shows like rush limbaugh like he did notice who was reading and who's talking about him um and we see this to this day Anytime somebody writes a profile about Matt Drudge uh, or celebrates Matt Drudge, who says he's still relevant, he, you know, um, you know, he's uh, an influential media mogul even to this day, he will link to that. I mentioned earlier uh, there was a contest uh, at the Daily Caller that Tucker Carlson had about who could write the, write the best Drudge headline. And I do believe, if I remember correctly, the winner was... Uh, the headline of like Drudge, the most powerful man in media, you know, <laughs> that's what won the contest because that is what you would get a Drudge link. So he did pay very close attention to who was reading. Now, he might not have been able to do that in 1998, um, but he was certainly doing that um, later on in, in the career. 
uh, Joseph Curl also told me something very interesting. He said the number one website people visited after the Drudge Report, because through cookies, if you're running a website, you can tell where people are going after they go to your site, was the liberal Huffington Post. Hmm. So his readers were not just people of the right. Uh, it was folks that wanted to check in on the right, and then they'd go to the Huffington Post to see the news, uh, maybe as they wanted to see it from the left perspective. So quite a range. I listen to a lot of these talk shows, and one of the things that's interesting about what you just said is they all use the Drudge Report. They never, almost never credit him, and you can pick up on the fact if you check around, they're all using the same stories, and there's only one place they could really have gotten it. Uh, does he know that? Oh, he knows it. Look, if you stood in the back of a campaign press bus in 2008 and you looked over the shoulders, uh, I'd say uh, 90 percent of the reporters would have the Drudge Report refreshing on their screens of their laptops at that time. Uh, this is something that uh, Clinton advisor Philippe Rines told me that uh, anytime something big popped on the Drudge Report, his phone would start ringing off the hook with reporters who would say a version of this. Hey, I just heard and they'd use the expression on the wire that this was happening can you confirm and it on the wire meant i heard it on the drudge report uh mainstream left-wing right-wing reporters were all reading the drudge report uh and uh and so were political operatives uh it, you know it's part of the job if you were in the war room for hillary clinton's 2008 campaign that you had to be refreshing the drudge report to know what was coming uh the problem was if you were on the hillary clinton campaign is there was nobody to call if you were mad at something Drudge wrote. He had this power where he was so elusive that, uh, you know, usually if you're a mainstream reporter and you write something that a campaign doesn't like, they'll get on the horn and they'll call your editor and they'll yell at you and they'll try to get it changed or, you know, at least just want to be heard. There's no one to call at the Drudge Report. <laughs> and that was always very frustrating to political I, I campaigns. Noticed. And I, I think Drudge loved that. I can't remember the, if you appeared or, or maybe you and Jamie – Weinstein both appeared on the Megyn Kelly show, and I noticed that the Drudge Report linked to that. Did the Drudge yes. Report link to your podcast? Yes. Yeah, so he linked to the interview we had with Megyn Kelly, the full interview uh, on the website. And and so we knew while we were working on this that he was watching. And he was listening. I also had an interesting thing where while I was working on this, after I started doing it, just about everything I would write uh, would appear on the Drudge Report. I'd write a story for the Washington Post or a publication, and boop, there it would be. And I don't know, maybe that's coincidence. Maybe I write drudgy kind of articles. <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't know if he was playing a cat and mouse game with me or if I was, you know, um, you know, starting to see conspiracies in my Cheerios all of a sudden, you know. But um, but yeah, he he was listening, and he he wants to know what people are saying about him. Um, and I would argue, wouldn't you? So, did you guys make money off this? Uh, in the same way you'd make money as a journalist writing a, a story. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I, I was paid a, a fee for for reporting and, and writing the story. And then uh, we collaborated with iHeartMedia um, that supported the podcast as well. I mean, has it been worth all your time? Because clearly it's, you know, a couple years and uh, it costs some money. You know, I'll tell you, Brian, it's a... Um, I'd say the answer is yes. The short answer is yes. Because uh, for me personally, um, it, I think it's a story worth telling. It's something – when you see something that's on the minds of so many folks, they're wondering it or they've been asking these questions for so long, it's kind of nice to have somebody go and say, well, I'm going to go give it an old college try, try to figure this out. Uh, and also to be able – to gather these stories. Uh, like I said, we, we gathered stories from four separate decades um, to tell this history of, the, of media, you know, and this, this colossal shift into the digital media landscape, uh, I think it's really, really important. Uh, and, and so I, I had just an absolute blast getting to it, it almost like if you've seen Citizen Kane going around, you know, trying to find Rosebud, that kind of thing, <laughs> you know, uh, that that is such a joy to see different perspectives and hear different stories that maybe people, uh, you know, won't be able to be around to tell 20, 30 years from now um, to have these uh, in a format that uh, I hope is entertaining and engaging, um, but also tells uh, a, a history of, of some big changes in in not just Washington politics, um, but just media in, the, in this country as a whole. I, I think it's been a great experience. As you know, you talked about it earlier. His website really hasn't changed in 30 years. What does it say? that he has kept this simple, 
There's no fancy stuff, no fancy graphics. It's all regular. It looks like a typewriter type. And others have spent millions and millions of dollars to try to do a website and can't make it. What's it say about it? And has, has anybody tried to do exactly what he's doing? First answer is that content is king. Uh, it doesn't matter how pretty your graphics are or your beautiful shots in your movie. If you don't have a story to tell, if you don't have scoops in news, if you're not breaking news, you're not going to make it. Uh, you, you need to tell a compelling story, give new information. Uh, I, I think it's it's a lesson to anybody that is launching a new digital media outfit that uh, not to invest all of your dollars in making things pretty. Now, we don't want things to be ugly. It needs to be user-friendly. But is it engaging? Does it bring readers in? Does it bring people coming back on a regular basis? Are your writers, are your contributors developing relationships with the viewer in a way that I think Drudge did by just being such uh, an enigmatic and interesting person? Um, and, and so that's that's certainly what I would say. And then remind me of that that second question that you had there, Brian. Uh, I'm t I'm drawing a blank because I was. T OK, uh, but l let me d ask you this yeah. about uh, this this podcast. Are, is it open ended? Can you go back and add to it? Yes, uh, it, it is. Uh, it's just funny. Uh, once we have gotten to what we had planned for the final episode, more people started coming out as, as information came out and, and said, hey, I've got a story about, of Matt Drudge. And so uh, I continue to have an open ear. Uh, and uh, yeah, we could have another episode um, with some more information. Uh, I, I think we do tell a complete story in the piece. Uh, there's a full narrative arc um, that that that. Uh, goes over a lot of ground um but if there's more yes we are absolutely open um to more episodes okay a question for those who are uh technically challenged this is finding matt drudge what's the easiest way easiest way for somebody that wants to listen to this series to find it if you have an iPhone, you can just pull up the podcast app and search for Finding Matt Drudge, and it will come right up on Apple Podcasts. But a lot of people get their podcasts from different sources, so it's available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also just Google Finding Matt Drudge, and the episodes will pop right up on your browser if you like to listen to things on, uh, on a browser. Um, but it's very easily findable, and you start from the very beginning, and um, every episode leads into the, the next one, and we cover quite a bit of ground. So I hope people find it uh, where wherever they get their podcasts. Um, you can go right on the iHeartMedia uh, app as well, and you can find it there if you have the iHeartMedia app. You said you were from El Cajon, California. Where do you live now full-time other than Boone, North Carolina, where you're teaching? Well, I live uh, in the mountains of Northwest North Carolina here in Boone. So no, that's where you I live. live I live here full time. You... But um, I, I lived in Washington for many years when I was a reporter and in New York City uh, as well. So uh, I've lived a lot of places. Do you have a family? I do have a family, yes. Kids? Yeah. Uh, I do have a family, yeah, a, a child, yeah. <laughs> um, in, in this, how much attention did your podcast get in the general media? I mean, did anybody pay attention to it besides Megyn Kelly? Oh, oh yeah, we had, um, I, I've done many interviews across the country uh, like this one. Uh, radio stations, podcasts, shows, uh, gosh, uh, more than I remember, more than I can count. Um, lots of lots of interviews like that, um, and uh, write ups in the New York Post and some other publications. It's been really fun, uh, and then a lot of social media engagement, which is uh, Brian has actually been my favorite part. Uh, I had heard that when you do a podcast, the the most special part of it is is the relationship you develop with the listeners. That they speak to you as though they know you. That they're part of the of the show and i loved that because people would would come to me and engage with me on social media and over email um and we also um had a uh, a tip line people could call and leave a voicemail and i just loved going along the ride with the the readers um especially as they would pick up as we did shows like megan kelly and a num number of other programs um that was a uh, just a real joy and, and i would lo certainly love to to do it again um it, it was great to to kind of have a group going through this process with me, even though I maybe have never met them in person. Because you worked at the Daily Caller and you interviewed uh, Tucker Carlson, uh, this is, I don't mean this to sound like a trick question, but are you surprised at all about which way Tucker Carlson has gone with his career? 
Well, I think a lot of people um, have questions uh, uh, about him. You, you know, remember in the 1990s, Tucker Carlson um, and in the 2000s was one of the leading lights in magazine writing. If you go back and read his profiles, goodness, God, he is a writer, man. Uh, he's a great writer, beautiful writer. And I, I, he is to this day whenever he he sits down with a, a pen and paper. Um, sometimes he does that. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of people who know Tucker more than I do um, that also have have questions. Um, I, I can't really speak to it because I can't get inside his his head, um, you know. But uh, he certainly has had a varied <laughs> career. Uh, sometimes he surprises me, <laughs> and I think he surprises a lot of other people. Uh, I uh, that's kind of all I can I, I can say about it is that that I I can't get into his head quite and psychoanalyze him. I do know there are um, some books, or at least one book, coming out that might have some answers about his trajectory. Um, I know there was a biography that he did approve of that came out last year, or the year before. Um, but uh, the study of of Tuckerology does continue, and lots of people are interested in it. Are you going to do a book on your podcast? Uh, I don't believe so, because I think that um, uh, Matt Lyshek wrote a great book in Drudge Revolution, and I think the audio format really served well. It's it's the characters in this book, the people that speak to us, including you, Brian. Thank you for being part of the show. Um, add so much delightful flavor to it. The, the richness of their stories and having the diversity of voices, uh, I, I thought was um, a, a really special thing. Somebody did ask me, like, so why didn't you just write this? And it's like, well, um, because we have real flesh and blood people here uh, that we still have access to and we want to hear their voices. And we thought that um, an audio show would be a really fun way to do it. Now, maybe there'll be a video spinoff TV. I, I don't know. Um, one can one can hope and, and pitch, continue to, to pursue that if we want to. But uh, I, I think we've told uh, we've used the medium in a really effective way, I, I think, um, and uh, had a lot of fun doing it. In your search, and again, we're not going to reveal what happened at the very end, but in your search, you went to Las Vegas, set up a possible meal, but who told you that he could be found in what hotel at the $100 uh, slot machines? That was a tip from Matt Leshack, the biographer of, of Matt Drudge. I said, well, where can I find him? You know, because he, he lives all over the country. Like, if you can go to his house. I mean, I, I know his addresses. I've got this public information, but he might not be there. You know, you might fly into Arizona and, well, he's, he's in Florida right now. Or, you know, go to Florida and vice versa or Israel <laughs> or wherever. Um, but he does spend a lot of time in Vegas. He likes to go there. It's a, it's a place he spends kind of uh lug you know quality time and and so uh lee shack said uh, go to those hundred dollar slots uh around vegas particularly at what was um, what is now uh, or what was the bally's hotel um was now the horseshoe uh and you might find him there and so we knew that uh even if uh wherever he was in the united states if he was there that uh maybe he'd fly and meet us to vegas and we invited him to dinner in las vegas a place he loves at uh one of the places that he loves to go and so readers can listen to the Finding show. Matt Drudge, eight episodes, podcast. The host and interviewer is Chris Moody on that uh, series. And uh, we thank you so much for spelling it out to us. Thank you, Brian. It was great to be here. Thanks for listening to the Book Notes Plus podcast. Please rate and review Book Notes Plus, And don't forget to follow so you never miss an episode questions or comments, we would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.